Hello, it's lovely to meet you. I'm Mrs Pierce and I'm one of the co-head teachers here. And I'm Jackie Newton and I'm the other co-head teacher here and I work the first half of the week and Mrs Pierce works the second half of the week. Mm. And we'd like to show you around our school. We like to start here in the nursery where the youngest children come. So they, they arrive here from the age of three and they stay until they're four. And this is the nursery outdoor area, which we've worked very hard on because we have a system of continuous provision. So they spend a lot of their time learning both indoors and outdoors. And Mrs. Pierce will just explain about the catchment area. So as you can see from here, we've got quite a good view of the catchment area. We've got some privately owned housing on one side and we've got um, uh, social housing on our other side. We have a very eclectic uh, mix of families here. Behind us, um, the other side, which you can't just see at the moment, um, is the most expensive housing in the city is here. So you can see that we draw from a very wide range of, um, yes. it's a very wide range of communities. Mm. Yeah. So we have a really rich mix of cultures and faiths and beliefs and parents choose our school for that very reason because we are inclusive and we're really, really diverse in many, many ways. So we, our parents like it, the children like it, we get to experience all different uh, walks of life. We have to turn on a sixpence as leaders because we need to be able to deal with all sorts of people in, within the community. Um, but it really helps. We have a parent liaison worker, so she is a go-between between, between the school and the community and supports Sally and I big time in our work. She does all sorts of parent learning, family learning, signposting, food parcels, holiday clubs, um, anything she can to help these families. And as you see, as we take you round, um, you, we will talk about the teams in our school and how everybody works together to make this the most amazing school that it is. Yes, and we absolutely are so fully inclusive. Uh, right from the beginning, we have a child in the nursery at the moment with cerebral palsy. We've had children all the way through the whole school, right through to year six, uh, with similar needs. All of the classes, every single class has a child in there, at least one child in there uh, with autism. Every single class. So. And we make sure that all the children are actually in the lessons all together. Some of the children will get some pre um learning sessions outside so that they can access the sessions at the time but all of our children do everything together so what kind of uh, welcome would a child get with very complex needs coming to your school the probably the first thing would be the senkos would be liaising with the parents and find and the, the other professionals already involved with the child to find out the child's exact needs and they'll be getting to know the child they'd go and visit the child in their home or in their previous setting and work on transition we're really um, skilled in slow, thought, well thought out transition arrangements. So they won't just be in on day one, it will be built up. So they will be visiting and making themselves familiar with the environment and the smells and the sights and the scenes um, when it's empty probably, so that they get a good chance to have a really good explore without any pressures of other children being there. And then we'll build it up from there. There'll be lots of liaison as well with any previous settings, uh, with the parents and um, with agencies that we know will be involved in the future with that child. And we will get that all set up um, beforehand so we can meet with the parents and those professionals to make sure it's as smooth as possible for them. But, but we also, every single time, say to the parents, you know, we are going to make mistakes, we are going to get things wrong, bear with us, we're a team, we'll work together, you know your child best. So we will work on this and we will get it right but please forgive us because we're bound to mess up sometimes. So this is a really inclusive space. We do a lot of training events in here, CPD, training our peer mediators, um, family world food events. That kitchen was installed to support the work of our parent liaison worker. She has regular coffee mornings in here and um, family learning. She's got a mental health awareness course going on for parents at the moment hasn't she mm -hmm. which is accredited we've had mm -hmm. it training for parents screening the parents up mm -hmm. and then what we do at lunchtime the children come in here and they go along there and they choose from locally sourced cooked food here we cook it here and then they go and sit anywhere they don't have to sit separately from their school dinners friends if they're a sandwich person they can all sit anywhere and, and wheelchairs can get around everywhere Extra TAs can get in to support the one-to-one, -one, you know, the children who need one-to-one -one support. Um, it's a nice, spacious place that we're really pleased to have. Not all schools have got something like this, have they? No, so our nursery children through to our year two, two children use this space. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I just 
few children who have one-to-one -one adults with them who um, they they've got ASD and or ASC and they need a quiet space. They can't cope in the classroom for the whole session. So they'll bring them out here and share a book with them and sit here. And the world is always going by and they're never segregated. <laughs> they're not locked away anywhere because this is a, a, a central flow of our school. So everybody's saying hello to them. Everybody knows them. And then after that, sharing a book, maybe another activity to do with the book, they'll go right back into the classroom and join back in again. But it is a less busy space, isn't it, it? Is, um, yes. for them calmer. to access? It's calmer yeah. for them. But it isn't behind closed doors. Nobody's mm. trying to... So this is the Key Stage 1 playground and these blue fenced areas are foundation classes, so that's the children aged 5 and um, they do a lot of their learning outside which is what we said about the continuous provision in the nursery, it comes in use here. So inside the rooms they've got a free flow aspect going on but at certain times they do have focused activities where they teach specific things, phonics, reading, maths, that type of thing. Um, but we do make sure that at certain times of the day the foundation stage have this whole yard to themselves for their gross motor skill development. Mm -hmm. You can see over there in the corner by the fence is our friendship stop and the children know how to use that so if they're feeling uh, particularly sad or they haven't got a friend the other children know that they can go up to them and, and ask them to join in with them. Um, so that's used and is really quite popular. Beyond that, you can just see where the, the tree is, is our sensory garden. Um, perhaps we can go over there and have a little look at that. So it's interesting, we've got a school council and they really, we, we call ourselves a listening school because we've got lots of ways the children can have their voice heard. And in the school council meeting, they were saying that somebody was playing football regularly in front of the friendship stop. So we had to have that stopped and that was the children's voice that brought that problem to the adults' attention and then it was changed so that it could be a proper friendship stop again. So if you come round here, we've got um, uh, ramp access to our sensory garden and um, we started building this a few years ago um, in memory of a little girl who um, sadly passed away and she was a little girl who got additional needs and this garden has been developed over a period of time so that everybody can access it. It's a quiet area, a quiet space for reflection um, but there's also lots of activities in there that children can do, those who are needing those sensory needs. We managed to get the funding for this ramp at the time because we had a child with global delay and uh, that meant that we could have this ramp built with that disability access mm -hmm. grant money, do you remember? Mm -hmm. And now it's accessible for everybody. We've had all aspects of the community helping us with this as well. The fire service came in and helped build the shelters and various bits and pieces around here. And all the children at the time painted uh, one of the pebbles and that goes all the way through right round the back there. It's fabulous, isn't it? And so we've got this a little space that children can be um, supported in during break times if the big yard is too much for them they can come up here and have um, you know a quieter time and then children who haven't got additional needs come with them don't they? Mm -hmm. We often see classes up here, whole classes as well having story um, yeah. times under the shelter there with the storytellers chair. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got our science area out here that's fully accessible um, all the way around, it's been developed by our science leads in schools. There's a lot of work going into that this year. So children can come out, they can go pond dipping, they can have an outdoor classroom there with the shelter on. Interestingly, the um, monkey puzzle tree was planted the, the, the year that the school was built, 1924. <laughs> this part of the building, as Sally says, is key stage two side. So when the schools were amalgamated in 2013, we became heads of this half as well. So we had to set about really bringing the actual fabric of the building up to speed. So we replaced the windows, we had the roof replaced, we, we had all the French doors replaced on that hall there um, and made the building more fit for purpose. We painted so, it the same colours, the corridors, in yes. both buildings as well, so yes. they, they mirrored each other. And then we had this astroturf fitted and made this into an outside classroom, um, which has proved, well, we, it's paid for itself time mm. and time over, hasn't it? We can open those doors and make it um, into a learning space. And then those four mosaics on the wall, our, lit our arts lead commissioned a mosaic artist to do those. So every child in the school was involved in some of the tiling and they represent the different seasons. They're gorgeous, aren't they? Mm. 
sensory room um, that is based in Key Stage 1 building at the moment. Um, children access this with their teaching assistants. Um, it is timetabled, but it's also used in between time as well when children actually need it. Yeah, that's the little light channel and everything, isn't it? Can you just So all the classrooms have got interactive whiteboards in and yeah. um, in the reception class they're set at child height because the children can access these as well, mm -hmm. um, whether they're standing, whether they're um, using any kind of walking aids or anything. And you can see the um, uh, charts at the top, um, uh, visual, time visual time time tables that can be used and moved around um, mm -hmm. depending on the day mm -hmm. and what's happening in school that day. So would all the children use those or just children who need those? Um, Children who need them have them, but actually a lot of other children enjoy using them as well. So they can just reflect on oh, this is coming next. We're going to have our dinner after we've done this activity. Or, you know, I think it helps everybody, probably the staff as well. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we have all the nurture activities in here, don't we? And the turn taking and the meal mm -hmm. aspect. And it's lovely. And lots of children access this space during the week at this time. Time. So, you know, with your use of nurture groups, it's not somewhere you, you stay all the time, is it somewhere you visit? How does it kind no, of work? No, no. Uh, well, it's used for different groupings, maybe sometimes one to one, one to two, one to three, four. Um, sometimes it's used to get a group of children together, say, for an afternoon session um, where they're working on social skills. But it's not a space that children spend a lot of time in. So so the not, predominant not, time of their education is in with their class teacher. So it's not like rigidly timetabled no. or anything like that? Not in that sense, no, no it isn't. No. Uh, sometimes it's on a needs basis yes. that the children will go in there. And they will often go in um, with a friend as well who may not have any kind of additional needs, but there is a supportive process. Thank you. This is our peer mediators display corner. It's a bit faded because it's been up there all year. We've got a fresh one ready to go. So every year we train peer mediators in June, July, ready to go onto the, year, onto the yard as year six is in September. So they have a long training program after an application pro process has happened. So they learn about deep listening and reflecting back the facts and the feelings and working together in pairs and how to encourage resolution of any issues that happen on the yard. And the, the teachers really miss them when they're not out there. So they wear little tabards, they work in twos, never dive alone. And it's a really well established process in our school. And the children see it as a rite of passage because they've seen their, for the last nine years, their big siblings have been doing it and their friends and they've aspired to become a peer mediator. And they're really, really happy when they get to become one. So. It's a really well embedded part of our listening school ethos. Mm. Yes, um, when we actually interview them for the position, because we take it very formally in that respect, and um, the children tell us they've been wanting to be a peer mediator for years. <laughs> so we've, Sally and I have really believed in um, leading from the front, but bringing everybody with us. So we have focused a lot on shared visioning. And we've had Inclusive Solutions in to do lots of these events with us um, until COVID kind of put play to it, didn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but it's been a really important way of keeping everybody is, everybody's voice heard and everybody feeling as though they're contributing to the journey and bringing their own different levels of expertise and ideas to the fore. And then when we do our revisioning, we're able to look back at what we did in this case um, two years ago. And prior to that, we looked back to see what we'd actually achieved together. Were there additional things that we achieved or were there still some things that uh, weren't quite there? But it's really good to see um, that journey, so to speak, that everybody had been on and um, how much we'd achieved. This is the logo that um, we developed when we first joined as a whole school, um, as a whole school as a primary school. And all the staff were involved and the children in... Uh, coming up with our school logo in there. You can see how it's all interlinked to the letters and um, the um, strap line that they had was dream, believe, succeed and that stands for everybody in our school. So multicultural and so diverse and that just represents every child in the school. Is there a picture of every child there? Mm. And every country they're from? Oh. This is our um, Translators Council, so 
one of our um, teachers is responsible for EAL and she has a group of parents who offer to translate when we need them to um, and these are all the languages that they speak. It's really helpful, isn't it? Lovely. Right. I have, until today, had a former teacher who was a teaching, who became a teaching assistant teaching the whole school Spanish. It is a massive part of our school. We were still in the library. We've also got everything that's been digitalised now, all the books have been digitalised, and the children um, in Key Stage 2 can sign those books out themselves. We've had a World Hijab Day recently, and lots of staff wore hijabs, and it was really powerful, particularly for our um, young Muslim girls. And then this, we've got a lot going on in school about LGBT plus history and diversity in general. But we do have um, the privilege of having a school counsellor here um, one day a week and she does some extra sessions as well for us. And um, she works with individual children who have been identified by members of staff. And um, uh, she uh, talks with the families beforehand and then she has her consultations with the children over a period of weeks um, and their timetable to do that. It's very confidential. Um, unless there's any safeguarding concerns, so we don't know what um, she's discussing with them and the therapy that she's doing. Um, and then um, she also offers some drop-in sessions for children. They know that they can put uh, any requests to speak to her in a little box, and she checks those out when she comes in and arranges a 10-minute drop-in for them during the day. Um, this year we've been quite um, innovative in um, the role of our SENCOs and our attendance officers. We combine the roles because a lot of the children um, who have got additional needs um, will have attendance issues as well. Um, and it's sort of a double whammy really in terms of the knowledge that they have about the children. Um, and it's been a really good role. So we have um, two SENCOs and two attendance officers. Uh, they do between them... Um, Eight days. Eight days. A couple of those days um, they do PPA. But that's been amazing because we're able to monitor all the attendance of the children, they can talk with the parents of those children with additional needs and how to enable them to access school um, as much as possible, which is obviously the key thing for us. So we, can, we hold lots of production events here. And we can open the doors on both sides to make it into a gorgeous space. And this is where Sally and I stand and talk to groups of parents when the year sixes are leaving, when we talk to parents after the great productions that we do. This is where every Tuesday, every single child in year four, five, four and five plays a musical instrument, such as our clarinets and our trumpets here. And we do have a massive collection of trombone. All those places over there have got instruments in. Every child is allowed to play that. And then when they get into year six, they choose whether they want to carry on and take grades or do a general music lesson. So every Tuesday, this hall is full of music and it's beautiful. And our children get invited to music camp. So the first music camp um, for next year is I think September. And there'll be eight children going on music camp, which is an overnight stay um, with our music teacher and the um, uh, music uh, providers who come here. Um, We've had lots of children who take exams at the end of um, their year five or year six, and we get notified of that, and that's a, a, a huge um, part of what we do. That's creative side of things. A, a few of our children have gone on to join area bands and the Nottingham Youth Orchestra, and we've seen them in events where we've taken our tiny ones to the Albert Hall to watch things. We've seen our elder ones who've left playing in these bands, and it gives them something to aspire towards. It's really, really aspirational. So it's a much more pleasant eating mm. space for the children and it's also going to be used, as that says, as a community hall. Mm. So we, when we look at the space outside, we are advising the next head teacher to put some fencing around the side because there's a new, re newly refurbished gate, which we've had done as well, behind here. So it can be rented out for parties mm. and community events. And, uh, and we've had the accessible toilet fitted in there and we've got a ramp out there so it's fully accessible. Um, nice space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's much nicer for the community to look onto as well from the outside on the main road because it was nicer, wasn't it? Yeah. Cool.
How do you manage to include all your children in this inner city school right in the heart of Nottingham? Because we have created a listening school with various strands to it and the, the, the main parts of our ethos which support the listening school are the peer mediator scheme and the whole school restorative justice scheme. So every child, as we've said earlier, from the age of three, learns that if anything happens, they're going to be able to talk it through. So we don't have as much conflict as we used to have. So as soon as we've been using those processes for about 12 to 18 months, maybe two years, we started to see our exclusions reducing drastically over time until we haven't excluded anybody apart from one child one year and one child another year. Oh, for seven years now. Are they permanent exclusions? In that time, in the past nine years, we've had one permanent exclusion. So those two are fixed terms? Only two, fixed very terms. short fixed terms, yes. But looking soon, so children come to expect it um, from us now. They expect to be listened to. And as Carol said in the nursery, they um, want to see fairness and they want to see things put right, which is what we talk about. So when you go around our school, it's very rare you'll hear anybody shouting at children at, at all. There are lots of restorative conferences going on all over the place, little tiny mini ones, and our peer mediators are experts at doing that out on the yard as well with those um, minor squabbles where they can put, help put things right. And we get external agencies who come in supporting our children with additional needs, always commenting about the um, calm atmosphere in school, about how the children respect each other and the adults respect the children, which is key, mm. isn't it, really? Because it's got to work both ways. And the uh, parents are really happy with the processes and expect that way of dealing with things. And what about, you seem to be including, or you have included, a whole range of children with very complex needs. You know, all kinds of disabled children, autistic children. We have had children with cerebral palsy, yes, we've had yeah. um, children who are hard of hearing, with sight issues. Um, we've had children who are um, autistic, um, who've got profound dyslexia. Um, so what's, your, what's the secret? How, how, do you, you know, how do you get the whole team on board, including all these children with such complex needs? So it has been a long process. Um, we are constantly um, refining our CPD with staff, meeting the needs of the individual children. Um, lots of children come in with individual needs, so we have to have specific training, whether it's from health, um, or the psychology service or the autism team and they come in and support us um, but the staff all genuinely want to do the best for the children and to get to provide the best um, environment for them so that they can access. I think a key thing has been that initially when we were first head teachers of the infants we included children in the nursery so they started with us from a very very early age because they were children who lived in this community and they had every right to be in our school we believed so therefore the staff watched those children grow from teeny tiny little things gradually as part of the school the children didn't bat an eye with the other children it was it was just that was just the child their friend that was just their friend so because the staff got to know these children really well from very early on they didn't have any discrimination towards them they felt really fond of them and so when the next children came along it was an easy easier process and then we very quickly found that we had children going all the way through the primary school who had really deep and strong relationships with other children and adults who work here. So therefore it became a natural thing that more children with, with similar needs could be included. We've got a really good example of that. We had an outside provider come in to do some STEM work with some year five children. And uh, one of the pupils had a profound global delay and had one-to-one -one support with the teaching assistant. And during the, the session, the teaching assistant went to have her 15 minute break. And it was absolutely seamless. The children just went and sat um, with the little pupil, the pupil who got the profound needs, and took over what the TA had been doing with them. And then she just came back after her 15 minutes and slotted back into what they were doing. Um, so the children are so accepting and um, really don't discriminate where there's any kind of um, additional need at all. Thank you so much.